Let's learn everything about loops here in Power Automate Desktop. Today we will go through this loops category up here in the upper left corner. We will cover all five actions. We will take them one by one and we will have practical examples to go through you and I. So please open up your own Power Automate Desktop and do these things with me. You'll learn so much faster. On my desktop, I prepared an Excel book called Google Searches. XLSX. Let me open it. Here I have three columns. I have search, result, and instructions. I also have four rows Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, and Amazon. We will work with this. So let me close it for now. And then we will grab the location. I can press Shift if I'm in Windows 10 and then right click. In Windows 11, you can just right click. And here we want to find the copy as path, grab that and move to Power Automate Desktop. First off, we will find a set variable and drag it in. We will call this Excel path and this will store the path to our Excel book. So here in value, you will say control V, paste it in. Then you will delete the double quotation marks. Power Automate Desktop will not need that in the coming actions. Here I click save. Then we find a launch Excel. Now we're going to open up the Excel book. The trick here is that we want to read this data into a data table, which we can use a for each on and some more advanced stuff. In the launch Excel, we want to open up the following document. Here I could specify a document path. I could also click this and find the book on my desktop, but we created a variable for that. So I have this X and choose the path. Both things work. This is the elegant solution because then we use a variable for the path. So if the path changes, then we can easily just change the value up here. We are going to produce a variable called Excel instance. I'll click save. Then we're going to read the data because now we just open up the Excel book. So here I find a read from Excel worksheet and drag it in. We're working in the Excel instance. I want to retrieve all available values from worksheet. In advanced, first line of range contains column names. Yes, my data has column headers. So I take that. Variables produced. Excel data. Let's call this one Google searches. Again, it's optional, but it's nice to have our variables named by the data that's in it then it's much easier to maintain the workflows. I'll click Save. I also want a close Excel and grab it here. This is the Excel instance. We're going to save some data later on. So let's take the before closing Excel, choose Save Document, click Save. Let's go run it. Let's test that we don't have any errors and that we can have our data beautifully written in, in this variable. So if I go over to the right, in case you don't see these variables, in case you see something like this, just click the little X up here. Here we can see that we have four rows and three columns. Double click. Here we go. We have our data. Now we can introduce the for each. If for each, we will find that either in the loop category or by searching for it here. Drag it in after the read. A for each iterator collection. That could be a list, a data row, and most often a data table, which we have here. That is the Excel data Google searches. I want to iterate through this. What this means is that we take each run of the rows one by run from start to finish. A data table is a collection of data rows. That's why we can iterate over it. So here in the X, I click it. Excel data Google searches, double click here. Then this store into this is a reference that where our iteration is. So first one, it will be the first row, then the second row, the third row and so forth. So I can call this you and search It's again optional what you want to call it. I'll click Save. Let's say that we want to with this data over here from the Excel data, I want to take the search column. I will take each one of these values and do a Google search. 
So let's first open up a browser instance, then we can do it. This is a common use case with the for each that we want to do a search on input in some system. So let's first find a set variable, drag it in here after the first variable. I will call this URL. And in the value, I'll say google.com. This will be our website today. And then I want to open up browser. So I find a launch new Microsoft Edge and drag it in. This will also work if you have Chrome or Firefox. We will launch a new instance. Initial URL. Again, you click up here in the variable picker and choose the URL. We will create a browser instance. Fine. Click save. Now we can do something here. Let's say that I want to do a Google search. Let's just see that this works. Often when we work in Power Automate Desktop, I only want to test the first path. So here I can set a breakpoint. If I click over here with the mouse, then you will see there will be a red dot. This means that if I run this automation, then it will pause here and I can quit the automation if I see the first part works. Very smart. It will save you a lot of effort. This looks fine. We are opening up Edge and we are ready to automate. So up here, I can click stop. And it will stop the automation. To remove this, I simply just click again. Now it's gone. So what do I want to do here? Well, I want to populate this text field with a search. Here I find a populate text field on web page. And I drag it in, in the for each. So between the for each and the end, here I put all the actions that I want to repeat over and over. Here we have the browser instance called browser. Now we're going to create a UI element. The UI element is everything you see on the screen and on web pages. So I click add UI element. Then we have this picker. I want to pick this text area here. Press control on your keyboard. Click it. Now we have created this. Then we do a search. Of course, I could search for my company, for example, in a sense org, but this will be a static search. I want to target whatever is in the current row of the Excel data Google searches. And that uh, data lies in the current search. So if I delete this, click the X here, double click the current search, this will give me the entire row. So also the next two columns. We want to move into the search column. To do this, I have a hard bracket, then a single quotation mark. In the hard brackets, the column header goes. And since this is text, we have this little single quotation marks. The column was named search like this and have a single quotation mark and a hard bracket end. Let's say I want a space and then I want a CEO. We want to find out who is CEO in these companies. I'll click save. Then I also want, say I say Apple CEO. I also want to click this Google search. So I go back, then I find a click link on web page and drag it in here. We will create a UI element of this Google search, press control and click. So here we have the click and it's often nice. Let me show you. If I do this, you can see that I'm taken to another side. That, that means that if I want to do next search, then this text area might have a different address than the one we configured. So best practice is to go back to the start for each one of these searches. We can do that with a go to web page. Yeah, we can either do that in the beginning or in the end. And here I just used the uh, URL. Yes, then we open up a browser here. And for the first iteration, we will do a double one, but that it's fine. Then we know we are at the start. I can save the flow because there's no auto save here in Power Automate Desktop. And then we can test it. I often recommend to test it over and over to see that the steps we have built actually works. And that is that you don't build like 30 rows and then mm, you discover that something in the beginning work. So here we are. Microsoft CEO, we click the search, then we should go back. This looks like we have created the solution. 
Now you know how to use a fridge. Maybe. And that's also what you want to do here in the fridge. You also want to save data back. So let's say that we want to have this name Andy Jassy or Satana Tadella, who we want to extract to our Excel. Then we can easily do that here in the for each because that one will also be the same for each one of these rows. Right now we have a data table called Excel data Google searches. This is a data table. We read that up here from the Excel. There's no connection between the Excel and the data table. We use a data table because it's easy to operate much easier than to automate an Excel sheet directly. And then we can use the for each. This also means that we need to say so for the first extraction, we're doing an extraction once we did the search here, then we want to write it back to Excel. The first available Excel row, that is row number two, creating a helping variable or row number. Drag it in in the start of the for each. Here, I will call this row number and give it the value to click save. I also want to find an increase variable and drag it in in the end here. So here I want a row number and increase it by one. So for each one of these iteration, we will say add one to it because then we will jump in the rows in the Excel book. Now we can do some data extraction. So here I want a get details of element on web page. Let's talk about where we want it. I want it after the click link on web page. Yeah. So once we've done the search, we want to extract some data. We're still in the browser instance. I will click this drop down and then we will add another UI element. It will be this and I think we could pick that diff. So might might be a little bit more stable in case you want to know more about these selectors, how you build them. I also created a quite advanced video on that. You will find that up in the right corner. Anyway, click the control. Here we're extracting the text and let's call this one CEO. That is the value that we're extracting. Click save. Then I need to write it back to Excel. So I find a write to Excel worksheet and drag it in here. The value to write that will be the CEO that we just have extracted. Yeah. Where do I want to write it? Well, I know I want it in the B column. The first one is search and the B that was where I want to have the CEOs. The row, well, we created a variable for that. So easy. Just click the X here and say row number. We'll click save. Then we can run and inspect the results. So what we added here, we know that all of this works. What we added here was the actual searches uh, that uh, we get some data extraction out. So hopefully this works. Uh, it looks fine. There's no errors produced in our flow. That's also always a good sign. In case you like this, please give the video a thumbs up. That will really help me and my channel a lot. It could come out tomorrow. Thank you. I think we're about to come to an end to this flow. And this will, of course, also work with more Excel rows. Right now, it's just four, just to make it easy for us. Here we go. We have the CEOs beautifully written out. I will, because we are going to create another example, I will delete those and save the Excel book. And let's also close some of these Google searches. We could, of course, have uh, our flow to do that. Anyway, so what you learned here before we continue, that is you learned how to use a for each on a data table. You learned how to take elements out of that current search, the current item, you know how to use them. So to populate the search, you also know how to write it back um, to the uh, end for each to the data table. One thing that we might want to do, you can see this selector here is called diff anti jazzy. This is really specific. What I want to do is to go up to this stack of paper, just rename it, right click, rename and then say diff CEO, maybe something like that, you can see it changes over here. Now we jump to the next thing that we're going to learn today. That is the next loop. The next loop skips to the next iteration. That is the for each here takes the collection from start to finish. If I for some reason 
don't want one of them uh, to be um, processed, then I can have a next loop that will just skip to the next one. And let's look at our data again. So I click the X, click up here. Let's say that if the instructions of the current row is skip, then I don't want to do this. So how does that look? Well, you can have an if up here in conditionals, drag it in here. So here I need to ask if the Q and search, yeah, the instructions column, again, just use it like we did here with the search, a hard break, single quotation mark, I will say instructions, there's no magic involved here in Power Automate Desktop, it's so easy, you just need to get the right idea. And you will get that by practicing like you do here. Sorry. Here, if this equals to skip, then I want to take the next iteration, then we should not do all of this. So it will be next. Yep, next loop, and I'll have it in here. One thing that I just need to know now, that is if I do that, let's say that I do that, then I will not have this row number to be increased because that happens here. And this one takes the next loop. So that one will continue down here, up here, it will skip all of this. So for this to work, then I need to, there's also a nice practice to practice these uh, row number variables, these loop counts, move it up here. Now I know that we will have that variable increased whether or not we are skipping. And then Let's talk about it. Then the first iteration will now be two here, but then immediately it will get one to it. So there'll be three. So to fix that work, uh, to make that work, then this should be one. We can try test it again. So what we did here, what we want to see now in the extraction is that we are skipping the apple because the instructions is skip. And we want to see that we don't do an apple search here and no data is written back. Then we have configured our flow well. I think it looks like it worked because that was the second iteration. Then we will have the Amazon. Yeah. And we should be closing. Let's go back to the Excel book. There you go. Now you can also do the use the next loop. We could look at the instructions. If that was skip, then we don't want to do a search. Let's close it for now and go back to our flow. Another important loop that is the loop condition. A loop run a loop condition runs over and over as a certain condition is true. Let me just show you. So I will click in here, I'll say Control A, right click disable action. Yes, I want to build it to this flow, but often it's easier just to disable all of this. So we don't have to go through this, we will focus on the loop condition. So I'll have a loop condition. Yep. Yeah. What I need to do is to drag it in, drag it in here after the launch edge. Loop condition runs as long as a certain condition is true. That could be one equal to one. This is true. And if I start my flow, I have created an infinite loop because this one is always constant. There's no way I can change this. So this is bad, bad practice. Now I created an infinite loop. I don't want that. For now, we'll create another infinite loop. I will just say true equals true. This is a Boolean. That means that this is a Boolean can only have a true or false. And once I have this code block start code block finish, then Power Automate Desktop know it's a Boolean. We will use that in a little while. So what, are we, what can we use this loop condition for in real time? Often I want to do checks. That could be check if a current website is in a state that I want, if it is, then we can continue. Otherwise, it will try again over and over until it reach some kind of a limit. Let's try to build that in into our flow. So if I go to a browser, let me go back to Google. So when I arrive at this Google site, I know this is quite stable, then I want to check that it's in a state that we can work in. That could be that we have this Google icon or we have a text box, because then I can automate. If I don't do this, then Right now we have them disabled, but then there's a, a risk of me just processing all sorts of clicks, which the system can't do. So we want to build in checks if we have unstable systems. Let's try to pretend we have that. Yeah. 
So in the loop condition, I want to check for some kind of a UI element on this. So I find a if web page contains and drag it in here in the loop condition. Right now you can see here we don't have a browser instance that because we disable it. But let me just click save. Let us enable this one here. And let's enable this. So now we have enabled the URL the variable and the launch new edge, I can go back here. Then I can, I can it's a little grammarly, I can pick the browser here, and then we need a UI element. So I want to say add UI element. And let's just have this text area again. If I'm using this text area again, we already created a UI element for that. So in case I want to use this, I can simply just go up here and pick it. Otherwise, I could pick another element. But that will be a good check to see if the web page is in a state that we can automate. So now it says, if this is present, then I want to do something. Here I want to say, um, I want to set a variable, I want to introduce a helping variable. here, And we want to call this Google text box exists. And we can say equals to true. If this is not the case, well, then we can have an else and else say, make sure you pick the else and not the else if. If this is not true, that means that this is false, then we're performing the actions between the else and the end. What do I want to do here? Well, then I'm trying to reach the web page again. So I'll just try to navigate to google.com. So we reload the page. In the ideal world, we also want to have some sort of wait, maybe 10 seconds here. But since we're a bit busy today, we will not build that in. So let's see what's happening. We are opening the browser, and then this loop condition runs, then we're going to check if it's in a state that we want, that is the search box is present, because then we can process all of this, then we will have this variable equals true, otherwise, we'll try again. This will also be an infinite loop, this will just do checks over and over and then perform one of these. So in order to change that I open up the loop. Function. I delete this, then I want the Google text box exist. As long as this is false, I want it to run. And why does this work? This is because we initialize Boolean here, we say that we say that this is a Boolean because it's true with percentage signs in, in the start and in the end. That one is false when the flow starts. So once we start up here, then this Google text box is false. So this is true, then it will perform this. If it finds it, it will be true, and then it will go down here. This loop condition will no longer be true. So it will skip and perform the other one, we know that this text area search is present. Let's try to test it. And let's try to make a few errors to test our flow. So I'll set a breakpoint here, click run. So right now it opens, it goes into the loop. And let's try to navigate to, for example, anasjensen.org. That's my web page. Then we know that our flow when I click continue, should try to reload the page, it went down here. Now you see that it went back, I can try once more. And yes, this is very manual too. But this is to mimic an unstable web page. Now, we have the Google, let's try to test that we actually go out, then we break out because it finds that window, we have made an efficient check. So far, so good. So this is a way this is how to use the loop condition. But still, let's say that if it if it's down for some reason, then this will go on forever and ever. Let's try to make a backdoor out. So what I can do here is to find a set variable, drag in the set variable before the loop condition, call this one loop index, and give it the value one. This is the first time all loop runs, then I need to increase that with one each time this loop condition runs, I can find another increase variable. Yeah, variable name, that will be loop index. And I will increase it by one. 
nothing happened, but right now I have a counter. So if it's the first time it will be one, then it will increase to two, three. Then I need to build this into this con uh, condition up here. So let me double click it. So here we will have an, a double condition. I want to make sure that this loop runs as long as the Google text box exists, is false, and this is important. And then uh, when and the loop index should also be less than four. So these two must be true. If one of them is false, then I want to break it out. That that ensures that we don't run it like an infinite times. So I could also say ten or twenty. So to make an and condition here, then I need to rewrite this a bit. So first I'll rewrite this expression and then we will add the loop index condition. This is another way we will often use this in loop condition. So make sure you learn this. So if I up here say this one, Google text box exists is equal to false. The reason why I don't use percentage sign here, that is because this is a text box. So I only have text, it only have the percentage signs in the start and in the end. If this is equal to true, so if this is false, if that is right, then I want to run the loop condition. So essentially, I wrote the same as before, just in a little bit in, an, in another way. And then I can say, and I can have my, then I want to say, and in case the loop index smaller than four. So both of these will be true. That ensures that it will only run three times because once it reaches loop index four, then it will not run. More. Let's try to test that. Here I'm launching again. And do this. Click run again. Now you will see that the loop index over here ticks up. So now it's two. Go back here. Let's try to run it again. Now it will be three. This will be the last time it runs. web page and then it's done because the loop index was four. And then this condition up here wasn't true anymore. So it quit the loop condition. Now we build a backdoor. Of course, here, let's say that our web page is down, which is what we're trying to mimic here, then we want some sort of a notification because right now, when we come down here, there will be no difference whether it's a success success or not to launch the system. Let's try to do that. So first, go all the way to the end. We say that we have all these actions that is in our final flow. We will enable those. Then, sorry, I will have a label. And then we will drag it in here at the end. Let's give the label a name. I'll call it end. A label is a label that you put in a certain line in your flow or subflow. And then you can jump to that label. We can jump here to the end. So let's do a check after the end. We can check if the loop index is equal to four. Then we want to skip all of these and we might want to make an exception message. So after the loop condition, then I'm saying if loop index equals or then I know that it tried three times, three times and failed. Then we can click save here. So and what are we going to do? Well, have a set variable. Drag it down here. And let's call this one transaction status. And here we can have a system exception, you can have more detailed exception message. But for now, this is good. We could also say that the web page couldn't load or something like this web page, blah, blah, blah. For now, this is a good transaction status. Then I want to have not have these actions performed. And to do so, I simply just find a go to drag it in here. I move to the end, and click Save. So when this reaches four, then um, it will say, Okay, this is four, we will set this exception message, and we will go to the end. That will be the most common use case of a loop condition, how you, you want to do these kinds of checks there will also be other use cases, but um, try to do this to make it load three times. So you'll see that we are, it works as we know, we know that this will be the last time. Then you will also see that it jumped to the end because we can see here the transaction status is system exception. 
that one we set here and jump to the end. Let's look at another loop type. That will be the loop. First, we're going to reuse something. So click this if web page contains all the way down to the increase variable, press shift in, mark all of these, then you say control C to copy it. Then click the set variable all the way to the end, shift, right click, disable action. In the real world, I want to have um, disable actions deleted when I move this flow into production. For now, it's fine because then you can save it and have it as a later um, book. So you can see what did we do here if you want to repeat. Yes, then we get an error here with the loop index doesn't exist. That's fine. We will fix that in a little while. Let's first go to loop. A loop runs x times where you define the x. Let me show you. Let's drag it down here. So that could be start from one end to three with increments of one. This loop will run, yes, three times. Then a variable called loop index will be produced. So um, the first loop index will be one, two, three. Save here. And now we will not have it. Yeah. Then you click the end of this loop. Say control V, we paste in what we had before. And that was because um, this, this makes it a little bit easier. So this loop here, this runs exactly three times. That means that if we find this Google text box, then we want to exit the loop just as we did before. So this is just another way of solving the case before. We can do that with a loop index instead, with a loop instead. So what you can do, we can introduce the exit loop. That was the one that we needed. So after we set this variable to true, then we can exit the loop. We don't need this increase variable. So I'll delete this. The loop index will increase automatically up here. I also don't need the else here. So I can delete that. And then this move it'll go to web page. I can move that one up here. Because now I know that uh, this will work. So we will navigate to Google. Then we will check does this exist? If yes, then we will exit the loop. We will end down here. If it's not, then uh, this one will be skipped. We will go up here. Loop index will be two. We will navigate to Google again. Do the check times. So then we just need to change this if here. I can say that if the Google text box exists is equal to false, then we can perform these things. So this. If this is equal to false, remember the percentage signs, then we know we have something wrong here. Let's try to run it again. And again, please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you see. And that way, uh, uh, that will help me so much. So let's see what happens here. Um, so what happens here was that it worked because it, uh, it found this one here and it jumped uh, down here and ended the flow. If we want to test it, we are setting a breakpoint here. And again, we can navigate to like a different site. That could be again, an Jensen org. I'll click run. I hope you learn a lot from these live builds. It's usually when you build stuff yourself and have it explained, then you learn a lot. Now you see that this works. Just also see that this work. And the loop index will be three. This will be the final part. Yeah. Like this. Run. And then it will end. So you can see here, and then this uh, will have a system exception. It didn't find the Google. What we just need to add here, a minor thing that could be a close web browser all the way somewhere in the end. So we actually clean up ourselves. If you want to learn everything about Power Automate Desktop, then I created this video for you. It will take you to all techniques required in Power Automate Desktop. We are building a complete use case like we did today, a bit more advanced and longer. I really think you should go watch that to improve your Power Automate Desktop game.